Do we want to go to recruiting? Um, not everyone's yeah. satisfied at this point about where 2025 stands, DJ. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, there is a lot of, I mean, there is some concern from the fan base because it's been so dry. Um, you know, coming off a national championship, having the new coach smell, um, being a three-time Big Ten champion, you know, where's the bump in recruiting, um, you know, and and you would say, well, there was a lot of turbulence in the offseason with the coaching change, but you see in other programs where the coaching change actually brings uh, a big bump in recruiting. You know, they call it the new coach smell, like I, I previously mentioned. Um, and I think some of it's it's, it's valid. You know, I th actually think a lot of it's valid. Um, but, you know, the, today, actually, which is nice, there's actually been a nice wave in predictions for Michigan for some key players, uh, such as uh, Taz Williams, who's a wide receiver out of Texas. He's more your, your Z-type wide receiver. Uh, Henry Ruggs, if you will, type of receiver. Uh, he's previously from Pennsylvania, but he's a, a very good wide receiver. He might be the next one to drop. If, if I had to make a prediction – who would be the next to commit to Michigan? I would put him because he visits this weekend, and there's a lot of uh, momentum with him right now. Uh, another top uh, recruit who got uh, predicted today was Dwayne Galloway, who's a top 100 corner out of Columbus, Ohio. Mark, Are you familiar with him? You familiar? No, familiar? I'm not. I'm not a recruiting guy. All okay. the recruiting stuff I hear is from guys like you. That's okay. it. Kind of seeps in my brain from having these kind of conversations, well, but otherwise, well, no, I'm not a recruiting guy. Ohio state's crushing it right now with corners. You guys have like two, two of the top five corners in, in the class this season. So it's not like you're hurting. So, uh, and then we got, uh, we're leading for Alex Graham, who's a four star uh, top 200 uh, defensive back out of IMG Academy and another big recruit who should, I mean, it's the type of kid who, uh, why aren't you committed yet? His name's Avery Gatch. He's Gash. He's an offensive tackle out of Michigan, uh, uh, top 200 offensive tackle. But you know, he's one of those kids who wants to, you know, see wait until the summer before he commits to a program. But that's looking very promising. And then uh, we're making very good progress with a running back out of Ohio, Marquise Davis. Uh, Michigan's climbing the ladder there. And uh, Ohio State's not really giving him the attention that they're giving other uh, recruits like a Bo Jackson or uh, or the big one you guys are being recruited or uh, favored for, which is Jordan Davison out of modern day California. But, uh, you know, those are some of the things that's going on. And then there is a five star that are the best chance for us to land a five star is Andrew Balboa, who is the number 15 overall player and number three uh, offensive tackle out of, out of Kansas. So there is some promise. But. You know, with all that promise, there is the concern of is Michigan doing enough? Because right now we're ranked in the 50s after a national championship. Um, and it's early in the game, right? It means nothing in, in April. Uh, things will pick up this summer. But, you know, the concern is, is NIL where it needs to be? Now, we know the money's been raised. Like, we know there's over $10 million in, in – uh, I know – I the, it's, it's more public now, but there's over $10 million raised. Some of it's going to current members on the team, so this is why you didn't see the portal jump. But uh, is Michigan willing to give NIL promises to these high school players and become competitive like all the other uh, top programs are doing? And that's the concern. Is the philosophy where it needs to be? Is the strategy where it needs to be? And is there the backing and support of the administration like there is at other top programs across the country? Yeah, TJ, I was going to ask you about the the, the NIL situation because part of it is the money, but also it's um, by player. Once you get to that point, <laughs> you know, you know what what you know what's in it for me. What what do I get as an offensive lineman? What do I get as a wide receiver? You know, what's what's the the hard number? You know, I, I'm not sure to what extent um, Michigan's developed like other programs are. You know, in terms of uh, you know, how that all kind of fits together. You know, maybe there's just a big blob there saying, hey, we've got the money, don't worry about that. But but there may be more hard numbers with, uh, with the competitors to Michigan. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, one of the, I mean, there's a lot of issues here and it's kind of layered to be honest with you, but the reality is some of these programs have been doing NIL, right, for like 30 years. So they have pipelines deep and we're talking about the Alabamas, the Georgias, you know, your Southern programs, your Texas's, et cetera. You know, this has been going on since the 60s. 
you know, some some deeper than others. SMU was one of the most public examples there was, and, and they were made an example of, while other programs that they, you know, the NCAA turned their head on. But so, you know, so those big money donors, the sugar daddies of those programs, they have been attached to the programs for a long time, like your Texas A&M's, um, because their donors are actually uh, very aggressive, where they pretty much control the AD and uh, make a lot of calls uh, with the president in terms of like decisions within the program. And Michigan is very conservative in that aspect. So like when NIL became legal, which was 2019 or 2020, fairly recently, uh, Michigan didn't even develop an NIL program or endorse a collective until last year. So we had a, every other program had a two year head start. We were two years behind. And then now we're fine. We, this past year, we started endorsing collectives, but they weren't all in. But since uh, there was a lot of threat of players being poached uh, this past, you know, in January and February, uh, February, a lot of donors have stepped up. The collectives are now more uh, organized and there seems to be a focused structured effort uh, with the program uh, starting, I would say this January, but the results have still not been, uh, we haven't seen the results, you know, we're still waiting on, some type of tangible evidence that it's actually functioning properly. So, I mean, that's just where we are. You know, I would argue that our NIL is not Michigan should be recruited at a top 10 level annually, top 10, not top 15. People want to say top 15. No, not top 15, not top 20, not top 25. It should be a top 10 annual program. It doesn't need to be one, two or five. It doesn't need, we don't need that because kids portal all the time. It means nothing anyways. But you do need to get a foundation of talent, your cornerstone players, and then develop players around those cornerstone players. Because the reality is, and a lot of people want to argue, well, Michigan's been doing it this way for a long time. Uh, look at how we won the national championship. Well, for one, we won the national championship with pre-NIL players. Your Blake Corums, your JJs, your Will Johnson was pre-NIL. Uh, Donovan Edwards, who, who was very big in the playoffs and the Ohio State game, as Mark knows, no shot taken. Uh and uh, these players, Blake Corman has been on record saying if NIL was around when he was a recruit, he may not be at Michigan. Imagine that. You know, that would crush us. So Michigan needs to be more competitive uh, if they want to be competitive going forward. Yeah, just a quick point about, uh, you know, where we need to, you know, it would be great if we had something that was very structured that had to do with the offensive line, where, where it would be sort of known. If I'm a top offensive lineman, I can come to Michigan and here's what I'll get. And it's going to be better than anything else that's out there because Michigan is offensive line university, you know, something to that effect would be awesome. If, if we had some, um, not just brand overall, but some, you know, like I, I know if I'm a certain type of player, I want to go to Michigan, you know, maybe it's offensive line. Maybe it's also when you say, when you say top 10, you know, I, I think a lot of people say, well, aren't there academic restrictions and that maybe we can't be top 10 for that reason? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's an excuse or not. It would be great to hear your thoughts on that one. Yeah. So in terms of like the academic uh, requirements for Michigan at, at the high school level, it's it's far more lenient than it is for like a, a junior to and to portal from another college because of a credit issue. See, the academic issues in Michigan is more of a credit transfer issue. Like, for example, when uh, when Drake Nugent transferred from Stanford the highest academic uh, program you could transfer from in, in college football. All of his credits didn't even transfer to Michigan. That's how stubborn their admission process is. That's insane. So, um, and also if anything above a 60 credit, so they have a 60 credit threshold, anything above the 60 credit threshold, they won't even allow. You have to have Michigan credits to transfer. And that's why you have trouble with your Terrence Shannons in the world or your Caleb Loves in basketball. That's why Juwan Howard was having all that trouble because he was getting upperclassmen to try and transfer. So you either need to be a freshman, a sophomore, or, or a graduate, uh, uh, a graduate uh, transfer. And uh, in terms of uh, a structured system to where an offensive lineman is like, hey, I make this much, what has been discussed in Michigan is a team-based salary. Now, this has been discussed for over a year now. Uh, Jim Harbaugh was trying to put this in place last July through Empower, and uh, we have the money but it's not in place. And I don't know why. And, and I've, I've heard theories and rumors uh, from pretty connected people, but like no one's giving me names in terms of, is it Ward? Is it, is it the regions? 
you know, is it Sharon uh, not allowing it? I don't think so. Uh, but I don't know who it is. I have an idea on some regions who are difficult or stubborn or, or archaic. Um, I won't name those names right now because I don't have true confirmation. I just have some hearsay. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess we're going to find out. I think, to be honest, this offseason, this summer is going to be very telling on where we are as a university in terms of recruiting and uh, true uh, administrative support for the football program. Yeah, very, very. Uh, th this whole thing is fascinating to me because, well, first of all, I, I had to redo calculus. That was that was painful. So I, I kind of remember that, you know, <laughs> yeah. it was the same exact class. So but uh, but anyway, the uh, you know, this whole uh, conversation is fascinating because, um, you know, there's so many sort of like, is Michigan an academic institution? Does it impact the U.S. news rankings, national rankings? How do we stack up with UCLA or how do we stack up with Harvard or Stanford or whatever? Um, does letting a few players that are coming in uh, take us off the board? Does it make us, you know, does it take us from being the number eight you know, ranked college to not in the top 20 just by doing that. Um, you know, I might do some research on that. I don't know if anybody uh, on this uh, actually knows that, but, but that's, that's, uh, that's something to kind of research, you know, a as a regent, what do I care about? I, I do care about kind of that ranking of where Michigan is yeah. relative to other universities on the academic side and does the athletics bending, you know, bending the rules or not bending the rules, but moving the bar up and down. Does that, um, you know, does that impact the overall ranking, you know? Right. I, well, I think that'd be a very interesting, interesting analysis. I know Mark did the, uh, he did the college analysis of like uh, academic uh, rankings and, and uh, you know, I think uh, if, if Michigan were to, lessen the threshold or the uh, the criteria for an athletic transfer. I personally, I don't think it would affect the overall academic standing of the program. Now I'll say this though, there's a very hard position within the university because I'm sure there's people watching this right now. Like, no, don't do that. You can't affect the, uh, the prestige of the university academically because as Mark has pointed out, research dollars uh, drive these programs and it is more important than athletics. And I, I know there are, I've had this argument with people, and they talk about how much more is donated through research and other academic uh, donations. And I don't disagree, but it's also true that when you have a competitive ac uh, athletic program, it boosts everything within the university from tuition to admission uh, or in terms of people submitting applications to overall marketing. There's no better over, there's no better marketing than uh, a college football playoff run. Right. So um, I think there's gotta be a balance somewhere. I, I do know if they are going to change the, uh, the admissions policies for athletes only instead of not just uh, students, but uh, strictly athletes. It starts at Santa Ono to the regents. This is not a ward manual uh, situation. He has no control you over can't the blame uh, ward for this. So. Correct. This is not a ward. Yeah. We can't blame ward for this one. All right. Hey, Mark, just a, just a one little provocative idea for you. Uh, what if uh, let's say Harvard has a $40 billion endowment Take take one billion dollars of that, go independent as a football team, and uh, try to see if you can make it to the college football playoffs within four years. Yeah. So, what happens to their? I don't. I'm trying to think how large is their enrollment, and what happens when they recruit a hundred football players that have to play at that level. Yeah. Oh, I, Stanford specifically? Like you're talking about academic? Well, Stanford? I mean, yeah, I could, could be Stanford. Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. Did you? Oh, you said Harvard? I said Harvard, but yeah. Oh. yeah. Could be Stanford. Yeah, he was, he was trying yeah. to go really ridiculous. <laughs> I, I don't think they, I don't think they even know that. I, I bet if we went to Harvard tonight and walked around campus and started talking about the, the college football playoff of the national championship game, probably like, 92% of them don't even know what that is. Well, well, find find three billionaires from Harvard. Have them fund it. You know, that, that could be another way to do it, right? So Again, I don't know that they even care. Yeah. But we're looking at, so when you guys were having the, the, the conversation and trying to find that, okay, who else recruits in the top 10 
and has those kind of academic standing. And the first school that came to mind for me was Notre Dame. Yep. And now I'm looking at the public university rankings and I'm seeing that UCLA is ranked right there with Michigan. Now they're not recruiting quite at that level, but they have in the past. Uh, those are about the only ones I can come up with. Yeah, Ralph mentioned USC, maybe. Yeah, so so USC is a private uh, university, right? UCLA. And, uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah Ralph Holmes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, from my understanding, USC does have an athletic. Uh, they allow the athletes to come in at a different requirement academically. Um, okay. So that would be one loophole. Now, Notre Dame, for example, they have a team-based salary. Michigan does not have a team-based salary. So that's that's one limitation, you know. Um, plus, Notre Dame gets a very big recruiting boost with the Catholic, you know, private schools for uh, high school players. I mean, you can almost nail a, uh, a Notre Dame uh, recruit just by the school he goes to, you know. So that, that does help them. So, TJ, do you think that this recruiting, let's say, lack of a surge in recruiting is strictly mm -hmm. a, you know, you went through the history of the NIL collective and when it started and then it was a year or two or three late yeah, compared to the competition. And that's technically two or three years late right. or decades late. Yeah. Um, do you think the other big factor is the hardball? uncertainty oh that has put them behind in this recruiting cycle oh yeah i mean it crushed all momentum because you know kids didn't know and then you and we lost a lot of kids we were we were that were leaning us like marcus wimberly out of arkansas who was one of my personal favorites he was going to commit to michigan because jay harbaugh was recruiting him at safety's position um but they're gone so he's i mean he's going to visit in the summer but i don't know you know a southern kid they're hard to pull um yeah we lost a lot of momentum with a lot of For kids some schools they are for what? I'm just kidding. Oh, I said for well, some schools they are. Yeah, right. No, I mean, hey, Ohio, hey, I don't know though. Miami's been uh, the Florida schools are pulling their kids back from you guys, Mark. Uh, I know last uh, last deadline you guys lost a few kids, but uh, no, I mean Michigan definitely has a hard time with Southern kids. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean it definitely didn't help. It definitely did hurt. And when you have a whole new coaching staff, you have to build new relationships and. Sharon Moore is now, I mean, the entire month of February was getting the coaching staff together, building the NIL program or the the infrastructure for the NIL in terms of hiring Sean McGee. And then we just saw uh, one of our uh, directors of, uh, shoot, what's his name? We just got him from Georgia. I'm trying, I got it right here. I think his name is John Collins. Uh, I think he's the director of operations now. He was formerly at Georgia. So he's building the, uh, the, per, the player personnel recruiting department. Yeah, well, he's the assistant director of recruiting, John Collins, uh, previously of Georgia. So, like, he's he's building this infrastructure of, of these of of these uh, of these guys who are in the know. They understand the recruiting game, and uh, you know, I don't know. It kind of just feels like we're getting our we're we're now jumping in the pool. Everyone has started the race, and we're now we're now swimming. Yeah, it's and, a good way to look uh, it. Yeah. And it's April, so it's a little concerning. I will. I'll tell you this though. I think our NIL strategy is making the road a lot harder than it should be currently. I, I, I still don't have full confidence in our NIL strategy at the high school level. In terms of player retainment, I do think we have a good NIL strategy. But uh, high school prospects, I, they, I haven't seen it yet. You know, I just haven't seen the tangible evidence. 